Hold on on tight tight for the the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into into a place, a zone zone called called the alternative to the alternative alternative media. media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. All right, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Okay, here we are again on the Investigative Journal on this February 22nd, 2018 day on our calendar. In the last couple days, I've been talking about how hemp oil products can help your health as well as put some money in your pocketbook if you want to spread the word and tell people about uh, how these products can really help you if you have certain ailments. And uh, I wanted to start out by just mentioning that the first company I was dealing with was CTFO, and I gave you the website and everything to go to, and you can sign up and uh, look at the products, buy the products. Also, uh, if you want to join as a sales associate and you're sitting at home looking for ways to pay your mortgage, looking for ways to get some income, this is a good way to help people as well as make some money for your family. So I wanted to provide this money-making opportunity, and I put it up on my website at greganthonysjournal.wordpress.com for a reason. And I've gotten a number of people who are interested, so if you're thinking about it, give me a call at uh, 619-202-4660, and that's going to be an important number, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. Or you can email me at gregbeacon, that's G-R-E-G-B-E-A-C-O-N, at uh, gmail.com, and I'll uh, give you some more information about this company, uh, as well as how you can uh, get involved selling it, uh, selling these great products. Now, legally, uh, medical uh, cannabis or hemp, now hemp is legal anywhere. It's not the same as uh, marijuana. But anyway, let's talk about medical uh, cannabis. And it's legal in all the states except two. And half the states allow medical um, cannabis with THC, uh, the uh, psychotropic element that gets you high, and half the states don't. Now, Mexico recently came aboard a year ago and allows medical cannabis in Mexico, as well as, well, of course, we talk about Canada. But uh, in Mexico, they follow suit with the states that only allow uh, cannabis, CBD, in these HPD, HPD products without the THC element of the psychotropic element. So those are the products you can buy uh, legally and companies are now start. It's a great, uh, great way, uh, time to get involved in this opportunity. And you can work at home, have a chance to make a good income and it's the perfect time. And I talked to you uh, yesterday about what Forbes magazine has said about this industry. And if you get in now, you're getting in basically at the bottom floor. Uh, and you can uh, make yourself a, a nice chunk of um, money, which always comes in handy. And it's the hottest product in the marketplace that I've seen in the last, uh, you know, 30 to 40 years. So you can, um, you can take these. Uh, there's testimonials on the webs, on the internet that'll show you how they work. And, uh, give it a shot. So go to my website at greganthonysjournal.wordpress.com and uh, you can read how you can get involved. I do have a website called CBD Healthy Living Products. My CTFOCBD along a mouthful.com. You can get that on the website. Go right there. You can sign up right there. Look at all the products. And I'm giving my subscribers and listeners over the years the first opportunity to do that. Okay, I said 619-202-4660. Starting next week on Thursday, I'm going to uh, begin again once a week taking calls and doing a show where you can call in. And I'm going to do that Thursday on First Amendment at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. So if you've got some stored up questions that you want to ask me, I'm going to open up the phone lines again. The number will be 619-202-4660. And uh, you can dial that from your cell phone or Skype or wherever you want to go. And I'll take your calls uh, on a Thursday evening for one hour, okay? So let's uh, remember that. Now, yesterday, I was thinking, you know, I was uh, 
doing the show, and I, well, at, right after the show, I was listening to, every year the conservatives come together in Washington, and they call it CPAC. It's a conservative get-together where they rally the troops on conservative uh, right-wing views. And I was listening to them, and it just struck me how people congregate to either the left or the right in America, hoping that their side will win and their values will be uh, spread throughout the country. The country, of course, is split in half, and half the people love conservatism and CPAC, others hate it. Now, the question I have is, is this the, really, what they're, do people on both these sides really believe in what they do? Of course, the top people know that it's only a game and that they're playing with you. For example, the left and the right are constantly throwing things at you so you keep, you keep, you know, you're placated by them. You're, you're not, they're keeping your eye off the real ball. And the real ball is the agenda of the one world order, the one world religion, the one world government. And they bring about it this way through what we call the Hegelian dialectic. And what they do is the left and the right seemingly, uh, are strongly opposed to each other, but actually they work together, and if you rub these two groups together, they create a bunch of chaos, and in the end they create a synthesis that is what they both want anyway. And what they really are doing is pushing you, whether you're conservative or liberal, to a one-world order, one-world government of control, of basically a system where... All your rights are going to be taken away, although people will, you know, they will love it. They will listen to the propaganda. Oh, how beautiful a world it's going to be if everyone is together. Now, they do this in many different arenas, whether it be the uh, spiritual arena, whether it be creating wars, whether they, you know, for example, when they, when, you know, yesterday they were talking about school shootings. Now, isn't this interesting that you know, if you go back 30 years, you never heard of one. You know, how come there aren't any school shootings in other countries? Just here. Are the American people maniacs and want to kill people in schools? Or are these false flag, uh, staged events that are put on by black ops, by both these parties that know what's going on? at the higher levels, in order to get their agenda moving forward. And what that's going to be is gun control. What that's going to be is taking away your Second Amendment rights. And even the conservatives are talking now about how they have to eliminate certain elements of people from having weapons. But that's a difficult thing in America, but they're slowly doing it. And they're using these false flag events to do that. Now, Always after these shooting events, whether they be the Boston Marathon or all of Sandy Hook, just to name a couple, or the one in Parkland, Florida recently, there's always a number of stories that come out, investigators, private ones, not the media. I mean, these the media is really a joke these days, isn't it? I mean, these guys are paid a lot of money, whether you're a New York Times reporter or whether, you know, these Fox and CNN Talking heads, if you look at their salaries, it's obscene. I mean, they make 10 to 20 million dollars a year to basically further an agenda that is a crock of you know what. Now, on these stories, all of a sudden you get these people. I, I just amazed. You know, let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about. When I was in Italy working as a journalist, uh, they began this strategy of tension, this, these uh, terrorist events, orchestrating these terrorist events and doing it on a regional basis in, in Rome and other places. Bologna, remember the Bologna bombing in the train station? And also a number of bombs that went off in Italy, in Rome. And one, of course, uh, you know the story if you listen to my show. I was working on the, Ameri and the Ameri as an editor of the American newspaper, and I was about five seconds away from not being here on this earth any longer. They put a bomb in the newspaper. I was walking through the hallway and luckily uh, scampered down the stairs to the editor's room 
and uh, missed that bomb. It went off while I was in that hallway, and I was protected from a direct blast. But after looking into that, I saw that it had to be an inside job. And I went as far as I could with investigating before people came to me and said, well, you better stop here or you may be dead. But anyway, I learned how they do it. I saw it up close. I was almost a victim. In fact, I was a victim. And uh, it changed my life in a sense. So I saw how they were doing that in Italy. And there was no doubt in my mind the CIA was behind it. Black ops were behind it. Money was funneled in. Even they staged the Bologna bombing and other bombings in Italy. And remember that the bombing that I was involved in, that I was in as a victim, was 10 days before Ronald Reagan was making his first visit to Rome. And of course, about three hours after the bomb went off, uh, a, some organization, terrorist organization, said, let's, well, this is a message to the hangman Reagan and the, uh, the s- capitalists of America, you know. Okay. And we know that was staged. And the, there was no way they could get into this building where the bomb was put unless it was an inside job. Now, I did find out the American newspaper, which no longer exists there, it, it's an, it's an internet, uh, sh- uh newspaper and uh, the owners have changed but back then the uh, you know the CIA actually the money was coming to fund this newspaper through black ops okay probably drug money and things like that funneled through the Vatican and then ciphered down to their minions and uh, the papers funded (laughs) little did I know when I started working there but that's what we're dealing with. So they move it from the regional strategy attention to a worldwide strategy of attention. And there's pinpointing, they're, they're moving, and they're directing their energies now in the United States. And the reason they are is because they can't create a one-world government and a one-world religion without it, without toppling this country. And their methods are slow. It's like uh, a thousand uh, little knife uh, <laughs> points going into the country every day from every angle. And so what we try to do here is give you that perspective that these high-paid million-dollar journalists failed to do. And the reason they failed to do it is because... The owners are bought and paid for by the Vatican-led New World Order to bring about this New World Order. They can't do it unless the media is complicit, and that's what's going on today. Now, when you take one of these events like happened in Parkland, Florida, what always amazes me is that with all the technology we have now, I remember back in the old days, before there was a st- strategy of tension or false flag events in America, if if something did occur, and I'm not going to say that every now and then somebody's not going to shoot somebody else. I mean, there are a few people uh, in this world that have no caring for their fellow man, but... If there was some kind of event, whether it be a mafia hit or some type of uh, tragedy, there were thousands of photos. I mean, people, you you saw it in the newspaper, you saw the the blood, you saw things coming so that you could say, hey, wow, what an event. But now, they create these events, they they then cordon them off because they are staged. And wouldn't it make sense? Whether you go from 9-11 to Boston Marathon, the Oklahoma bombing, and all these other events that occur now on almost a monthly or weekly basis, with all these cell phones, uh, cameras, and with all of this technology, with the Internet, thousands of people taking, uh, you know, videos uh, and things like that, there would be some pretty interesting pictures, right? But you don't get anything. And what you get when you study what the media has done are staged events. Now, for example, after each one of these, a number of people do their own little research, (coughs) excuse me, on this, and they piece, start looking, (coughs) looking at the events 
excuse me, they start uh, looking at the events, like I said, and they start seeing things that really don't make sense. And if you go, you piece through all the information you get from the media, starting from what they show you from supposedly when the the uh, event occurred, the shooting occurred, to the interviews of these people that are obviously, uh, you know, coached. Until then, the media reports, the, you find, you look at the early media reports, some of which don't make sense, and they make mistakes, and you can see that the elements, just, it just doesn't add up. Because if it was a real event, and all these phones with cameras, and all these people taking YouTubes, and all these kind of, you know, uh, citizen journalists out there, we should have thousands of pictures you know, of these events that don't, mat, you know, match what the mainstream media is giving you. And what they're doing is looping together a few scenes, and they play it over and over again. And one of the interesting ones, I remember at Sandy Hook, somebody had pieced together the people that were outside of Sandy Hook after this occurred, and they watched a revolving door of the same people who were coached or paid to go in and out of the buildings like a merry-go-round. It was amazing. Now, there's a report out on the Parkland shooting that the kids that are supposedly killed, many of them weren't even born. They, they can't trace who these kids are. Now, when people read this on the Internet, they don't believe it. And the reason they don't believe it is that that old, uh, you know, George Orwell, 1984 maxim comes to play. The bigger the lie, the more the people believe it. And if they see it on TV, then they have to believe it. So you can show people evidence after pieces of evidence after pieces of evidence that these shootings did not occur the way the media is telling you, and they won't believe you. So, if you want to ask about how this propaganda campaign works, it works pretty well, because most people don't want to dig deep enough to get to the truth. And if you just take one of these things, and then you say, well, why would they do this? Our government couldn't do this. And there can't be Jesuit people behind this. They're just good educators. Well... Folks, it's just the other way around. And if you start looking at this, the agenda is pretty simple. Why? They want to take away your rights, and they're going to do it slowly. Your rights, so look, they're doing it. How come? Let's just switch. Okay, so they want to take away your Second Amendment rights of uh, bearing arms, right? Or controlling them to a point where... You know, you try to get a handgun in New York, it's almost impossible as it is. You know, they 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 run you through the hoops uh, like you won't believe, and it's very difficult in many places, Chicago. But in those cities, they have the high, like in Chicago, the highest crime rate in the country. But they have tough gun control laws. Why? Because the criminals have the guns. So the point is they want to take away any type of dissent, creating a simple mass of people who will listen to whatever they tell you. And that's why they're doing it. It's a pretty easy conclusion when you look at it. And then if you can see that they, they, these events didn't occur the way they tell you, then you are beginning to understand what I understood in the 1980s when I watched the strategy of tension in Italy unfold right before my very eyes. So... Here we have uh, the mainstream media buffaloing everyone. And like, uh, like I said, uh, it's up to you to research it, to do the best you can under these circumstances. And uh, like, okay, for example, the Hegelian dialectic working in this manner, in this situation that we just talked about. But think about what they do in other things too, as well as taking away your rights in health care. Now, if the, remember how the Republicans stated they gotta get rid of Obamacare. And you, that's all you heard about the people on the left were saying we need Obamacare. 
People on the right were saying, this health system has failed. Look at all the, the skyrocketing premiums. People are losing their insurance, etc., etc. So the, to give you an idea why I know this is what is the truth, that these parties work together, so the Republicans take the House, the Senate, and the, and the White House, and they still haven't repealed Obamacare. Because they never will. Because to, to create a one world order, you're going to need nationalized medicine. They're going to need to take, to take control of your doctor. They're going to need to take control of your medical records. They're going to tell you when and how you can be treated and when you're going to die. And that's why the Republicans haven't changed it, because they work together. Okay. So I did say 619-202-4660. That's going to be an important number if you want to listen to uh, the show. Mark it down on your calendar. On Thursday evenings, I will take phone calls from people. And you can call from your cell phone or Skype or whatever you want, one of your uh, app phones, whatever, and call me at that number. And if you have any stored up questions over the day, over the week, that's the day to do it. Thursday night, 6.30 p.m. Pacific time on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Okay, so we talked about how you can get involved with a great product, hemp. We talked about uh, the Hegelian dialectic that you don't get from the mainstream media. Uh, and now, in the sick, you know, isn't it nice sometimes just to forget about all this? <laughs> and just somebody, and the reason I say that is somebody sent me a story that I want to read to you in the second half hour. And... It's just an amazing story of faith and, and how people uh, just survive under the most unbelievable circumstances. And this is about a Russian family who was cut off from all human contact for 40 years, living in Siberia, unaware of World War II. And in 1978... The Soviet geologists prospecting in the wilds of Siberia, they discovered a family of six lost in a place called Taiga, T-A-I-G-A. And you know, if you're in Siberia any time soon, which I have never been, and don't plan on any vacations there, uh, their summers don't last very long, and the snow will linger into May, into June, sometimes July, and then start up again in September. So what kind of summer is that? Uh, it's a life of awful desolation, but this family survived. Endless miles of st uh, straggly pine, birch forests scattered with sleeping bears and hungry wolves, very steep mountainsides. And this family somehow was able to survive. So I want to read that story to you. Let's just forget about everything for a half hour. And uh, listen to an unbelievable story about this family in Siberia. Can you believe this? They didn't even know that World War II uh, was taking place. And you know the Russian conflict was, if you remember when Hitler invaded Russia and tried to take over Mo uh, Moscow. What a story. But this family had no idea, and they survived in the backwoods of Siberia for 40 years. Wow. And you think you got it bad when the heat goes off for a day. Or you think you got it bad when you can't take a hot shower. Wow, this family. Or you don't get a hot meal. I wonder how this family survived. That's what we're going to look at in the second half hour of the investigative journal. So come back. I'll be back soon. It's only a three-minute break. Back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment rights media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. 
If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a Third Temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The following program is labeled as dangerous and off limits by the supreme Jesuit command. But stand tall, people. Listen up, and you may just learn something. Dear Lord Jesus, this ain't happening, man. This can't be happening, man. This ain't happening. Okay, we're back for the second half hour of the Investigative Journal. And like I said and before the break, let's forget about the Vatican-led New World Order for a few moments. And look at this family. I was sent this story, and I just was uh, captivated by it and wanted to share it with you. For 40 years, this Russian family was cut off from all human contact, was unaware that World War II was even going on. And like I said earlier, in 78, these Soviet geologists prospecting in the wilds of Siberia, they discovered this family of six lost in a deep and dark place in Siberia. Now, the Siberian summers, like I said, don't last long. The snow lingers into May, June, July. Winter starts again in September. I don't even think there is a summer. Uh, But freezing cold uh, into... This life of desolation, endless miles of straggly pine and birch forests. And people complain when they're, uh, me included, I'm not going to just say it's other people, when their internet goes off for 20 minutes, or they can't get on their cell phone for 5 minutes, or their uh, TV goes out for a day. Oh, they can't 
think the world is going to end, but can you imagine? I don't think this family had any of those luxuries. And they seemed to survive. Now, they were living amongst bears and hungry wolves, steep-sided mountains, whitewater rivers that pour in torrents through the valleys, a hundred thousand icy bogs. The forest over there is the last and the greatest of Earth's wilderness. It stretches from the first, furthest tip of Russia's Arctic regions as far south as Mongolia, and east from the Urals to the Pacific. Five million square miles of nothingness, with a population outside of a handful of town that amounts to a few thousand people. All right, so mankind is uh, the minority there, the bear population much larger. Uh, and when the warm days do arrive through the blooms in this part of Siberia, and for a few short uh, weeks, it can seem almost welcoming. It is then that man can see most clearly into his hidden world, not on land, for the part this part of Siberia can swallow whole armies of explorers, but from the air you can see it. Siberia is the source of most of Russia's oil and mineral resources, and over the years even its most distant parts have been overflown by oil prospectors and surveyors on their way to backwoods camps where the work of extracting wealth is carried on. Thus, it was in the remote south of the forest in the summer of 1978 that a, heli uh, a helicopter sent to find a safe spot to land a party of geologists was skimming the tree line a hundred or so miles from the Mongolian border when it dropped into the thickly wooded valley of an unnamed tributary of the Abakan, a seething river, a ribbon of water rushing through dangerous terrain. The valley walls were narrow with sides that were close to the vert vertical in places, and the skinny pine of birch trees swaying in the rotor's downdraft were so thickly clustered that there was no chance of finding a spot to set the aircraft down. But peering intently through his windscreen, in search of a landing place, the pilot saw something that shouldn't have been there. It was a clearing, 6,000 feet up, a, a mountainside wedged between the pine and larch and scored with what looked like long, dark furrows. The baffled helicopter crew made several passes before reluctantly concluding that this was evidence of human habitation a garden that, from size and shape of the clearing, must have been there for a long, long time. It was an outstanding, astounding discovery. The mountain was more than 150 miles from the nearest settlement, in a spot that had never been explored. And, you know, the Soviet authorities had no records of anyone ever living in that district, ever. Now, the four scientists sent into the district to prospect for iron ore were told about the pilot sighting, and it perplexed and worried them. It's less dangerous, the writer Vasily Peskov notes of this part of the uh, uh, of Siberia, to run across a wild animal than a stranger. And rather than wait at their own temporary base ten miles away, the scientists decided to investigate. Led by a geologist named, uh, well, I can't pronounce his name, we'll call him Galina, uh, they chose a fine day and put gifts in their packs for the prospective friends they were hoping to find. Though they weren't sure, but they did uh, check uh, the pistol that hung by their side, and each one carried a sidearm for protection. As the intruders scrambled up the mountain, heading for the spot pinpointed by their pilots, they began to uh, come across signs of human activity, a rough path, a staff, a long uh, a log laid across the stream, and finally a small shed filled with birch bark containers of uh, cut-up dried potatoes. Then one of the geologists said, uh, Beside a stream there was a dwelling, blackened by time and rain. The hut was piled up on all sides with, a, with, br with rubbish, barks, poles, planks. Folks, it wasn't your average condominium in La Jolla. <laughs> if it hadn't been for a window the size of my backpack pocket, 
Uh, it would have been hard to believe that people lived there, but they did. There was no doubt about it, said this geologist. Our arrival had been noticed, as we could see. The, the low door creaked, and the figure of a very old man emerged into the light of day. Straight out of a fairy tale, he was barefoot, wearing a patched and repatched shirt made of sacking. He wore trousers of the same material, also with many patches, and had uncombed hair and an uncombed beard. His hair was disheveled. He looked frightened and was attentive. We had to say something, so I began, Greetings, Grandfather. We come to visit. The old man, he didn't reply immediately. Finally, we heard a soft, uncertain voice. Well, since you've traveled this far, you might as well come in. The sight of that greeted the geologist as they entered the cabin was like something from the Middle Ages. Jerry-rigged, jerry-built from whatever materials came to hand. The dwelling was not much more than a burrow, a low, soot-blackened log kennel that was as cold as a cellar, with a floor consisting of potato peels and pine nut shells. Hmm. Now, what about you people with that fine, beautiful tile? And if there's a little scratch on it, you're going to get so upset. Imagine living with potato peels and pine nut shells as your floor. Now, looking around in the dim light, the visitors saw that it consisted of a single room. It was cramped, musty, and indescribably filthy, propped up by sagging joists. And astonishingly, home <laughs> it was a home to a family of five. My goodness, what a story! What a story! Unbelievable. Okay, let's continue on here. So, that site was greeted by a geologist as they entered the cabin with something from the Middle Ages. Boy, uh, the silence was suddenly broken by sobs and lamentations. And then did we see, says the geologist, the silhouettes of two women. One was in hysterics, praying, This is for our sins, our sins. The other, keeping behind a post, sank slowly to the floor. The light from the little window fell on her wide, terrified eyes, and we realized we had to get out of there as quickly as possible. Led by Galena, the scientist backed hurriedly out of the hut, and retreated to a spot a few yards away. The, the, the women were in hysterics, as if they'd never seen a human being other than their family members. Well, they took out some provisions, and they began to eat away from the hut. In about a, half an hour, the door of the cabin creaked open, and the old man and his two daughters emerged. No longer hysterical, and though still obviously frightened, and frankly, they were a bit curious. Warily, the three strange figures approached and sat down with their visitors, rejecting everything that they were offered, jam, tea, bread, a piece of, you know, life in the big city. And they uttered this, We are not allowed that. When Galena asks, Have you ever eaten bread? The old man answered, I have. But they have not. They have never seen bread. At least he was intelligible. The daughters, however, spoke a language distorted by a lifetime of isolation. And when the sisters talked to each other, it sounded like a slow, blurred cooing, like a bird, like two birds talking, not human beings. And slowly over several visits, the full story of the family emerged. The old man's name was Karp Lykov, and he was an old believer, a member of the fundamentalist Russian Orthodox sect, worshipping in a style unchanged since the 17th century. Old believers had been persecuted since the days of Peter the Great, and Lykov talked about it as though it happened only yesterday. Now, let's do a little bit of history lesson here. Who do you think was persecuting 
uh, the Russian Orthodox. And who do you think was behind Stalin? We're moving ahead a little bit. And who wanted to wipe out the Orthodox people in Russia? Of course, the Vatican led New World Order. Stalin was one of their boys, Jesuit trained. Now this man, they can't get everybody, right? They can't get everybody. But old believers had been per persecuted in Russia since the days of Peter the Great, and Lykov talked about it as though it had happened only yesterday for him. Peter was a personal enemy and the Antichrist in human form. That's what they tell you in history. But we know who the real Antichrist was, a point he insisted had been amply proved by Tsar's campaign to modernize Russia by forcibly chopping off the beards of Christians. But these old, these centuries, old hatreds were conflated with more recent grievances. And Karp was prone to complain in the same breath about a merchant who had refused to make a gift of 26 poods of potatoes to the old believers sometime around 1900. Things had only gotten worse for the Lykov family when the atheist Bolsheviks took power. And if you go to the investigative journal, uh, you'll learn about how Western money and a Jesuit priest named Edwin Walsh, the father of our foreign service, the father of the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, was instrumental in bringing money to, uh, bringing money to the Bolsheviks and Lenin, in order to get Stalin a top position, and that was what they had to do to get Western money to keep the Bolsheviks alive. Another controlled situation in Russia, right? Now, under the Soviets, isolated old believer communities that had fled to Siberia to escape persecution began to retreat even further from civilization. During the purges of the 1930s, with Christianity itself under assault, a communist patrol had shot Lykov's brother on the outskirts of their village while Lykov knelt working beside him. He had responded by scooping up his family and bolting into the forest. That was in 1936, and there were only four Lykovs then. Karp, his wife, Akul, uh, Akulina, a son named Savin, nine years old, and Natalie, a daughter, who was only two. So there was Karp, Akulina, their two kids, Savin, the girl, no, the boy, and Natalie, a daughter, who was only two. Now, taking their possessions and some seeds, they had retreated even deeper into the Siberian wilderness, building themselves a succession of crude dwelling places until at last they had fetched up in this desolate spot. Two more children had been born in the wild, Dmitri in 1940 and Agafia in 1943, and neither of the youngest Lykov children had ever seen a human being who was not a member of their family. Imagine that. So Dmitri and Agafia, born in the Siberian desert, had never seen a human being outside of their family members. Wow. Wow. All that Agafi and Dimitri knew of the outside world they learned entirely from their parents' stories. The family's principal entertainment, uh, the Russian journalist uh, Vasily Peskov noted, was for everyone to recount their dreams. Imagine that. <laughs> and what do we do today for entertainment? Man, can you imagine? How, could a person, I'm just thinking, if these people, these two kids could survive because they didn't know anything else, right? And they, their, their major form of entertainment was recounting their dreams to their family members. Think about kids today, you know, constantly on their cell phones, going here, going there, YouTube videos, everything, man, playing these stupid games all day. Could they survive a day out there without that stuff? <laughs> I don't think so. But these two kids did for 40 years. Now, the like of children knew there were places called cities where humans lived cramped together in tall buildings. They had heard there were countries other than Russia, but such concepts were no more than abstractions to them. They, they were abstract. They'd never seen anything, felt anything, touched another human being. Their only reading matter was prayer books and the ancient family Bible. Aquilina had used the Gospels 
to teach her children to read and write using sharpened birch sticks dipped into honeysuckle juice as pen and ink. Wow. Could anybody think of that today here? Could you use a... Okay, I can't write. I don't have my computer. I don't have a pen. So I'm going to take a little birch stick and dip it in honeysuckle juice as pen and ink. Wow. When Agafia was shown a picture of a horse, she recognized it from her mother's Bible stories. Look, Papa, she explained, a steed. But if the family's isolation was hard to grasp, the unmitigated harshness of their lives was not. Traveling to the Lykoff homestead on foot was astonishingly arduous, even with the help of a boat along the Abacan. On his first visit to the Lykovs, Peskov, another geologist who would appoint himself, well, no, this was the, yeah, Peskov, the writer, who would appoint himself the family's chief chronicler, noted that we traversed 250 kilometers without seeing a single human dwelling. Isolation made survival in the wilderness close to impossible. They were dependent solely on their resources. The Lykovs struggled to replace the few things they had brought into the wilderness with them. They fashioned birch bark galoshes in, places of sh in place of shoes. Clothes were patched and repatched until they fell apart, then replaced with hemp cloth grown from seed. Okay, you know what I'm going to say now, folks. Look here, another use of hemp. They grew hemp, and if they were in Idaho, they'd be arrested. They grew hemp, they grew the seeds, and they replaced their clothing out of hemp cloth. Another use of the 25,000 25, other uses of hemp that I've talked about in the last couple days. Good for you guys, the Lykovs. The Lykovs had carried a crude spinning wheel, and incredibly, the components of a loom into, the, uh, into Siberia with them. So they had this little spinning wheel and a loom. They grew hemp and they made some clothes to survive. Moving these from place to place as they gradually went further into the wilderness to survive must have required many long and arduous journeys, but they had no technology for replacing metal. A couple of kettles served them well for many years, but when rust finally overcame them, the only replacements they could fashion came from birch bark. Since these could not be placed in a fire, it became harder to cook. And by the time the Lykovs were discovered, their staple diet was potato patties mixed with ground rye and hemp seeds. So here we go. They're surviving on hemp. In some respects, so you people, man, contact me about these hemp products. I'm not kidding you. Look, this, this really relates to my show, doesn't it? You know, the Vatican-led New World Order drove these people into the wilderness, because they were killing off the Russian Orthodox so that Russia could, you know, fall under the hands of papal authority. And here's two survivors that used hemp to survive, and that's what we've been talking about in the last couple of days, about how you can get involved using hemp. It's good for these people. And look at what the, the this crazy organized. They couldn't get everybody, right? These people were put into this situation. Why? Because of the torture that was going on in Russia. And it's a credible story. Well, so uh, they couldn't, uh, since they couldn't, you know, it became harder for them to cook. Let me check the time here. This is a great story. I could probably go on all day, but I only have, oh my goodness, I only have like three minutes but you know what? This is so good. Why don't you come back? We'll talk more about some um, things that are going on in the world today. But I'm going to finish up this story, at least in the second half hour of the show. Uh, so they lived permanently. They were they didn't they couldn't eat well now. They couldn't cook very well. So in some respects, what were they eating? Potato patties, ground rye, and hemp seeds. Now, in some respects, Peskov, the chronicler, makes clear the the uh Tiaga where they well they were in a place called T A I G A, the Siberian wilderness, did provide some things. And he said beside the dwelling ran a clear cold stream. Stan uh, you know, they couldn't live without water. 
Strands of larch, spruce, pine, and birch yielded all that anyone could take. They had bilberries and raspberries, uh, were close to high end, firewood as well, and pine nuts fell right on, on the roof. Yet the Lykoffs lived permanently on the edge of famine. It was not until the late fifties when Dmitri reached manhood that they first trapped animals for their meat and skins. Okay. Now, you vegetarians, don't go crazy. I think you'd do the same thing if you were under those circumstances, don't you? Yeah, of course. Okay, we have two minutes, and let me just finish the la this paragraph. Now, they're, so they're, they finally have figured out how to trap a few animals. Now, lacking guns and even bows, they could hunt only by digging traps and pursuing prey across the mountains until the animals collapsed from exhaustion. Dmitri built up astonishing endurance and could hunt barefoot in winter. Now, how could he do that? What about uh, frostbite? I, it's incredible. Sometimes re returning to his hut after several days, having slept in the open in 40 degrees of frost, a young elk across his shoulders. More often than not, though, there was no meat, and their diet gradually became monotonous. Wild animals destroyed their crop of carrots, and Ag Agafia recalled her late 1950s as the hungry years. We ate only rowanberry leaf, she said, roots, grass, mushrooms, potato tops, and bark. We were hungry all the time. Every year we held a council to decide whether to eat everything up or leave some for seed. Okay, so we're all out of time. I only got about 30 seconds. Go to my website at greganthonysjournal.wordpress.com. You can get shows going back over 15 years on what I call the Vatican-led New World Order. And don't forget, on Thursday evenings, 6.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 619-202-4660. So I'll take calls for an hour. So if you got any stored up questions, save them for Thursday. And I'll be there on First Amendment Radio. You know how to get that. You go to firstamendment.com. Turn on your Skype if you want to do, do that or just call in on your cell phone. And I'll take calls at 619-202-4660. Okay, hey, I want to finish this story. So maybe tomorrow I'll set aside a little time in the second half hour to do that after we talk about pressing world events, right? Okay, see you tomorrow on The Investigative Journal. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, Kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.